Today on Engine Power, we challenge ourselves to build a big block bracket racing monster from leftover parts. You won't believe the results. It's a little different not having all new parts, huh? No, this is going to be a good one, though. Welcome to Engine Power. Today, we're building a big block Chevy Bracket Blaster from bits and pieces we've had laying around the shop. Now, we're like a big percentage of you guys that have parts from several different engines just floating around. Add a couple of specific items to those, and you can create a super reliable bullet to pound on around town and have a really, really consistent bracket engine on the weekends. How will it accomplish those goals? Well, number one is cubic inches. The bigger the engine, the easier it is to make naturally aspirated horsepower because all those inches make torque, and torque is where horsepower is calculated from. This particular block has a 4560 bore, and the crank has a 4375 stroke, which equals 572 cubic inches. And that's big by pretty much anyone's standards. This is a Tall Deck GM 572 Sportsman engine that's been sitting on the shelf next to a pile of greasy parts for quite some time. Number two, we're using 93 octane pump gas right from the local gas station, which simplifies everything since we can get gas for it anywhere. And number three, we have to have adequate induction, which we have covered. The heart of the induction are Chevy Performance's Bowtie 572R cylinder heads that receive special massaging from Livernoy Motorsports. On the dyno, we're going to test a single plane high rise that accepts a single dominator and a tunnel ram that is capped off with dual 4150 carbs. The valve train is all solid roller, and the camshaft has a special feature that is mostly recognized in the racing world. Now, for accurate camshaft timing and ease of maintenance, a Jessel belt drive will simplify the task of changing cams on the dyno. Complementing it is an MSD crank trigger. The foundation for power and reliability lies in the parts we all use. Now, this crank is a 4340 Ford steel unit that's designed to run a one-piece rear main seal, and it's internally balanced. Now, the journals have a large radius for additional strength, but that also means a narrow bearing must be used. The rods are made of the same material as the crankshaft, 4340 Ford steel. Now, they have a 6 535 center to center and are an H-beam design. ARP 2000 bolts will keep the caps in place. The starting point for this project is block prep, and this one needs some TLC due to the amount of runtime it has on it. Now, we've already measured the bores, the crank journals, the rods and pistons, and the decks, and everything looks really good. So, the decision was made to freshen it up with new rings and bearings and put it together with most of the parts from the pile. The TLC we mentioned are all steps you can do at home, like refinishing the cylinders with a flex hone like this one we got from Goodson. The first thing you want to do is grab some WD-40 for lube and some shop towels because it gets a little messy. With the flex hone installed in a variable speed drill, here's how it's done. Spray the cylinder and flex hone with a few shots of WD. Get the drill going right as the flex hone goes in the cylinder. Check your progress often because some bores might need more attention than others. I'm running the drill wide open and cross-hatching the bore rather quickly. The end result will be between a 35 and 45 degree cross-hatch like this. Tiny and shallow vertical scratches are still present but won't affect how the engine performs. The important part is the bores are surface reconditioned for the new rings. Don't let the hone stop inside the bore. Keep it moving up and down as well as rotating all the time. The reason we can use this cylinder finishing method is because the cylinders we have are straight, round, and the proper size. If the bores were heavily worn, it would need to be bored and honed at a machine shop. While we have the drill in hand, we're going to do the lifter bores as well, just with a smaller version. The same technique is used as the cylinder bores. Just remember you're not trying to change the size, just refresh the surface finish. Another prep step is deburring the block, which means removing all the sharp edges and casting lines. And that has a couple of benefits. The first being you have a safer block to work with so you don't cut yourself. And the second, it helps prevent a place for a crack to start. A die grinder and a carbide burr are the tools for the job. These are both from Matco. The focus is on sharp edges and raised casting lines all over the block. Because this one's powder coated, they'll be easy to find. Don't use much pressure, the bird doesn't like it. 
a light pass over takes care of business. Now all we need to do is remove the rest of the oil gallery plugs. This will ensure the block gets cleaned inside and out in the jet washer. Our Kundal snap track hoist will load it into the jet washer where it will stay for one hour. The rest of the parts also get a cleaning, starting with the crank. It will sit for 15 minutes. Then we can give the pistons and rods the same treatment. With everything cleaned and prepped, the build begins. That's next. We're back and this build is continuing with assembly. Now we already checked all of our main bearing clearances and we have between 27 and 32 10 thousandths, which gives us the green light to continue. A unique feature to this block is it has grooves in the upper main saddles. That allows extra holes to be drilled in the bearing itself for additional oiling, which increases bearing longevity. Using a pocket scale, get the location the hole needs to be drilled in. Transfer that to the bearing and drill the hole with the bearing in a secure spot. Finally, we'll use larger bits to deburr the hole on each side. And this little bit of racing tech is complete. These bearings are narrowed to clear the radius on the crank journal. We ordered them from Clevite with their anti-friction coating. With a little assembly lube on each one, the crank is carefully laid into the block and the rear main seal is positioned. Now lube the lower bearings and position the main caps, tap them down, and lightly snug them up. Using a dead blow, tap the crank from front to rear and rear to front to square up the thrust bearing. Now torque the mains to 95 foot-pounds using extreme pressure lube. And the crank is secured. The next thing to go in the engine are our piston and rod assemblies. Now we already file fit our Molly ring set. They sent us a 16th, 16th, 3 16th package that uses a low tension oil ring which will free up a little horsepower. Now we gap the top ring at 22 thousandths and the second ring at 24. Using motor oil, lube the rings and skirts of the piston and drop the assembly into a ring compressor. The rod bearings are narrowed as well due to the radius on the journal. High viscosity assembly lube will protect them during the initial fire up. Now align the setup with the cylinder bore and tap them in with a dead blow piston knocker like this. Underneath, you ready? Yeah, come on. Be careful not to nick the journal as you guide the big end of the rod down to it. Seated. Now the cap and the ARP2000 bolts go in and get snugged down. Final torquing happens after they're all in. Forged aluminum pistons from JE fill the bores. They're a flat top design with a single valve relief which measures three cc's deep. This is perfect for our pump gas friendly setup since our compression ratio calculates to 9.7 to one. Now we can torque the rod bolts to 75 pound feet. The camshaft is next. It's from the used pile. It's a mechanical roller. Duration at 50 is 260 on the intake, 270 on the exhaust with 110 degrees of lobe separation. Lift is 670 on both sides. Bolting to it is the drive hub adapter Jessel sent so we can run their belt drive. On the front of the engine, Jessel's front cover goes on first. You may need to clearance the block. Ours was already done. This cam has a standard firing order and will be swapped out for a special cam back on the dyno after we see what kind of power this one makes. With a shim in place, we can install the thrust plate, which has a thin layer of silicone to prevent an oil leak. The seal stays dry since it's Teflon. With it snug, we can check the camshaft's end play. Jessel specifies between eight and 12 thousandths. We are in. The timing marks are aligned for the crank and cam, which gets us ready to install the belt. It's a round tooth cog style and goes in with the upper pulley assembly all at once. That completes the link between the cam and the crank. Last thing to do is degree the cam. 
Underneath, the high volume oil pump goes on. It has the pickup attached for the pan we'll use. Securing it is a special stud that works in conjunction with the windage tray. It gets positioned on the standoffs from a few of the main fasteners. Its job is to disrupt the vortex of oil in the crankcase caused by crankshaft rotation. With our Felpro gasket in place, the 8-quart Moroso drag race pan goes on, and with that, the short block is complete. Remember when we said we had the induction part covered? Well, this is what we were talking about. This is a Chevy performance casting that found its way to Livernoy Motorsports, where it received some of their porting magic on their CNC equipment. Last time these were on a big inch, big block, they produced significant power gains, so we're going to see what they're going to do for us. The springs and all the components came from crane cams, so we set the installed height at 2100 and we're ready to assemble them. The shim and locator are first, followed by the seal, which can be a little tricky installing, so be careful. Next, lube the valve stem and slide it into the guide in a rotating fashion so the entire guide is slicked up. The dual spring and titanium retainer is next and it all gets compressed with our MTI spring compressor from Goodson. Now place the locks on the stem and release the compressor. That's it, just 15 more to go. With Crane's Ultra Pro lifters installed and a 30 thousandths thick Cometic head gasket in place, the heads get mated to the block. Let me get the cylinder head installer. There you go. We're torquing the heads to 75 pound feet and declaring long block status. Coming up, it's make or break on the dyno. We're back and our 572 cubic inch bracket blaster is strapped to the dyno. Now we still have a few things to do and it's gonna happen fast, so make sure you pay attention. Strapped to the top of the heads are Comp Cam's 1.7 ratio shaft mounted rockers and controlling them are the 3 8 push rods. Cast aluminum valve covers will cover them up, and for increased ring seal and less intake charge contamination, a Mr. Gasket crankcase evac kit has been installed. And for induction, a Chevy Performance high rise topped off with a Holley 1150 CFM Dominator. An MSD crank trigger bolts to the balancer, the bracket and pickup are installed, and the gap is set. Wrapping up the racy parts is a Jessel front distributor drive, cap, and Excel Extreme 9000 porcelain booted wires. An electric water pump will circulate the cooling juice, and the last link is the exhaust, two inch hooker super comps that flow into three and a half inch pipe to direct the exhaust gases out of the engine. With 93 octane shell pump gas filling the cell and all the fluids primed, here's the initial fire up. Pat is confirming the timing is at 32 degrees. Since the Jessel distributor drive is up front, we put an MSD distributor in to drive the oil pump and complete the oil circuit out back. With a break-in and warm-up cycle behind us, Big Block Chevy, take one. Here is what a 572-inch rat with 9.7 to 1 compression and 93 octane does on the pump from 3 to 5,000 RPM. Load it up good, nice and clean. Paint still burned off the headers a little bit. Yep. 623 on power. Hey, man. And climbing like a monster. Yeah. 656 foot pounds. All right. You want to step up RPM? Yeah, let's step up around there. Yep. Three to 65, activated. Here we go. That just sounds so good. That looks pretty decent right there. <laughs> hey, that, that's, uh, that's pretty nice. 672 horse, 657 pound feet. Well, let's see here. We've got two other scenarios we got to do. The camshaft with yep. the 4.7 swap and the tunnel ram with two fours. Yep. So let's go ahead and just put 36 degrees in it, see what it does with this setup. Yeah. And call it a game to the cam swap. I'm all over that. Man, she fires up easy. Same sweep, 3 to 65 yeah. to 400. 674, 660. Sounds mean. 
I say we change the stick, run it once with this intake, then do the tunnel ram and, you know, let these folks see what the tunnel ram is capable of. We're going to find out. Yep. Cool. All right. We concluded the standard cam runs and got 674 horsepower and 660 pound-feet of torque. But, like all things, there is room for improvement. This new bump stick is 14 degrees larger everywhere and is on 114 degrees of lobe separation. Lift is 100 thousandths more at the valve. Plus, it has a 4.7 firing order swap built in. What we mean by a 4.7 swap is we've changed the firing order of the cam, and that does a couple of different things. One, it reduces torsion on the crankshaft, and that helps reduce main bearing loading. But just as important, it changes the pulses back into the intake manifold, and that helps even out fuel distribution. Normally, an increase of 5 to 10 horsepower is not unheard of, but since our cam is significantly larger, we're going to see more. We set the timing back to 32 degrees. All right, let her rip. Other than that, everything is the same. Like any parts change, we'll run the engine before we make any pulls to check everything out. Thing sounds awesome. Uh, it's a little cracklier. I can sit and listen to it all day. I don't know if cracklier is a word, but I just made that up. Sounds good. <laughs> Three to five. All right. 603 on power, 639 on torque at 5,000. It's down 20 on horsepower and down 17 on torque. When it starts to get up into the RPM range, when the thing starts having a higher amount of volumetric efficiency, that's when the cam will really start to come in. So we'll make another up to 6,000 RPM. Wow. 702, 645. Pat pulls a plug, which shows we're safe enough to up the timing to 34 degrees and take it to 6,500 RPM. 706 horsepower, 644 pound feet of torque, and that's as far as we'll push this setup. Time for an induction change, and it's gonna be a big one. A Wyand high ram intake topped off with two Quick Fuel Technologies Black Diamond 750s. This special oil pump drive will plug the unused distributor hole. With the timing back at 32 degrees, we'll take it to 6,500. The carbon butterflies are now line of sight with the intake valves, and the longer runners will increase the torque loss from a bigger cam install. Oh. Uh, 737, 666. Sweet, nice and job. And only 32 degrees of timing. It's so safe. Let's make a carb change. The left side ran richer. Smaller jets will fix it. And last pull is to 6800. I saw that needle hit a really good That's number. That's pretty awesome right there. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Woo! 750, 680. That is nasty. Wow, we cooled it down a little more than normal, going for a big number, and we nailed it. In our opinion, the tunnel ram not only looks awesome, it actually is the best setup for this engine combination, cranking out big power numbers everywhere in the range. Now this engine isn't going anywhere. We're bringing it back in the near future to show its full potential. That's right, this bracket blaster is going full race status because we're turning it into a high compression race bullet. Now that'll include new rods, pistons, cylinder heads, intake manifold carbs, and the camshaft. You don't want to miss it. But today, that's it for us. We'll see you next time.